Hey everyone, today's video is going to be another video about ECMO. However, this time we're specifically going to cover VV ECMO and just the subset of ECMO related to daily monitoring of the circuit. So this is going to be a dense, info-heavy video. Um, it's really to, meant to give you a sense of, one, what is all this data being generated by the patient in the ECMO circuit, and what, is, what do the different aspects of the data mean? And then which of these data are important for you to know and make your decisions based off of? Obviously, there's going to be some institutional specificity to this, uh, but we will try to cover enough general theory uh, to make this video applicable to everyone. So talking about ECMO patients, these are, again, the sickest patients in the hospital, right? They're being kept alive by their attachment to what's functionally kind of a slimmed down heart, lung, or cardiopulmonary bypass machine. Um, and so, again, even if they weren't hooked up to this machine, they're very sick patients, they're in the ICU, they've got all sorts of the ICU level data related to them. Um, but they also have everything that comes from the machine as well. And so it's really easy to get bogged down in all the data that comes out of the patient, have a hard time uh, sorting through it, and then much less using that to make any sort of decision. So this video is going to be really about um, kind of giving that very entry level understanding of this and hopefully making your life uh, a little bit easier as you're starting to get into to get into the flow of dealing with some of these patients. All right, so just a brief review, when we're talking about ECMO, um, ECMO stands for extra corporeal membrane oxygenation. So there's functionally a membrane that sits outside the patient, blood gets delivered from the patient, passes through the membrane, and then goes back to the patient. Uh, the membrane is responsible for both oxygenating the blood and removing CO2. Uh, and in this case, this is VV ECMO, so the first V, blood comes from the vein and then it goes into the circuit. And then the second V, blood goes back and is delivered back into the vein. And that's important because there's no actual bypass of the heart in this case. So this is a lung support only method of ECMO support. Um, and when we're talking about which cannula we use, um, if there are two cannula approach, then they're usually in the IJ and the femoral veins or potentially both femoral veins. Or you could possibly use something like a single stage cannula that would be often in like the right IJ, for example. Uh, if you want more review of these basics, you should look at our uh, previous ECMO videos or some others that can be found on YouTube. Now, when we're talking about data, there's really two main sources of data or kind of easy classification of this data in your head. One is data related to the patient, which we're going to talk about now. And then afterwards, we'll talk about data related to the machine itself. So first, we're going to talk about uh, the patient's vitals. Of course, vitals are vitally important, as it were, uh, and should always be part of your daily review of your patients. Uh, but vitals are a little bit different when it comes to ECMO patients. For example, we want our patients satting over 85% is a very acceptable goal. Obviously, this is much lower than we would accept for a typical patient than these patients that have some sort of respiratory failure um, that's very severe at baseline. We're okay with a little bit lower baseline. Uh, we also want to look at the temperature a little bit differently. If you see any fever in a patient on ECMO, uh, even if it's lower than you'd normally get worried about, that's usually a sign of an impending infection. Uh, if you think about it, the ECMO circuit takes a vast amount of the patient's blood volume out of the body and uh, basically regulates the temperature of that blood. So it artificially cools the patient, even if they're trying to have a fever. Um, so if their temp's slightly high or if the tech kind of tells you in the morning if the patient's, quote, like chewing through ice, they're putting a lot of ice to support the circuit, that probably means they have an infection that you otherwise might not have caught. Uh, and then you also want to look at the heart rate. And so this is important when we think about you've got a certain volume of blood throwing, flowing through the ECMO circuit that doesn't change. But if the patient, for example, gets agitated and becomes very tachycardic, their cardiac output changes rapidly. And so what may have been a pre-existing steady state, and you had a roughly similar ECMO circuit flow and um, cardiac output can get um, severely disrupted if the patient gets agitated and tachycardic, because now there's a lot more blood circulating through the heart than the ECMO circuit is providing. And that can provide a, a relative mismatch between the two in a desaturation that's actually related to agitation and cardiac output as opposed to an issue with a ventilator. So that's just something important to keep in mind. Now, another key thing to look at is vent settings and data related to the ventilator. So again, obviously this is lung support. Um, so a big part of what ECMO allows us to do is rest the lungs. Um, so what will be a common rest lung setting for our patients is what they call 10, 10, and 10. And this is meant to stand for a PEEP of 10 a driving pressure of 10. So for example, the kind of peak pressure related to this ventilator should be something around um, 20 
right? You get your baseline PEEP of 10 and then a driving pressure of 10 over that with each breath. And then also a respiratory rate that's quite low of just 10, rep, 10 breaths per minute. Um, again, this is something just to check on in your patients when they, certainly when they first get put on ECMO, you want them to be in a nice um, resting ventilator setting and you can start to increase this as the patient gets better. Um, and then the other thing you want to look at related to vent data is often the first sign of improvement that the patient will have is an increase in tidal volumes. And that's because uh, the lung compliance has started to improve. You can look at that trend over time. All right. And then the last key patient factor is really related to labs. And this is where we start to get into more of the patient interaction with the ECMO circuit itself. And so first we just have some basic labs, for example, um, as you can imagine, having a large bore cannula and bypass machine hooked up to a patient can make them relatively anemic just from uh, dealing with that extra volume related to the circuit. Also, blood flowing through a pump can have some issues with lysis. And so it's very common for these patients to have some anemia and need intermittent blood transfusions. <clears throat> the key is for most people, a uh, goal of just greater than seven is okay. That's your transfusion goal. You also want to look at things like your lactate and just make sure that that is normal. That will tell you that the circuit overall is providing good perfusion uh, to the rest of the body. We also typically have these patients on some degree of therapeutic anticoagulation to prevent the circuit and especially the membrane oxygenator from clotting off. Um, and so you're typically monitoring anti-10As if you're on a heparin drip, which is probably the most common. Uh, however, we're also frequently using by Valerudin at our institution. In that case, you'd be monitoring PTTs. And then finally, the real meat of the lab data uh, are the blood gases. And this is what I want to really spend some time looking at. So there's three separate blood glasses that are all drawn at the same time and give us a whole lot of data related to our patient and our ECMO circuit. And so if I just make a brief drawing here, so let's say we have a patient right here. This patient has blood flowing through their arteries and um, is hooked up, of course, to the ECMO circuit. So blood comes out of their veins, comes down here, goes into the ECMO circuit, which I'll just draw as related to a membrane oxygenator here. The blood comes back from that membrane oxygenator and goes back to the patient. And so when we're talking about our pre-membrane, post-membrane, and arterial blood gases, um, let's just start with the pre- and post-membrane first. This is pretty straightforward. The pre-membrane is drawn off the circuit before the membrane oxygenator. The post-membrane blood gas is drawn after the membrane oxygenator. Then the arterial blood gas is just drawn from an A-line somewhere in the patient. Arterial. So what is the role of each of these blood gases? The arterial blood gas is arguably one of the most important, and that's just basically tell you, telling you, is this whole circuit, this whole setup we have, working well and providing, you know, keeping the patient alive, which is really what it's doing. And so to measure that, we want to know, is our oxygenation working well? So we want a PaO2 of greater than 55. Again, this is much lower than you'd want typically. Um, and ideally, we'd really have it greater than 60. Uh, but we're, again, allowing a little bit of uh, worse values than normal just because we're having to work so hard just to give the patient any support at all that we're, we were willing to tolerate a little, little bit lower values than we typically would um, for your uh, more standard patients. You also wanna make sure they're having good ventilation or clearance of carbon dioxide. So you want an adequate PCO2, but there's not really a number associated with this. Um, this is more based on the pH, right? So you can have permissive hypercapnia in the patients whose lungs aren't functioning very well. So they can have an elevated PCO2, but as long as their pH is normal, we're willing to tolerate that. All right, so that covers your arterial blood gas, and that's actually not that different from what we're looking at in most arterial blood gases. Um, just we're a little bit more permissive with our hypoxia and hypercapnia. So now let's talk about the pre- and post-membrane blood gases. So in the pre-membrane, what's nice is there's actually not a whole lot to know from this blood gas or a whole lot of a lot of really key numbers. It's mostly a comparative blood gas for you to be able to compare the post-membrane to, right? Because a lot of times we're worried about, okay, how's the oxygenation relative to the previous, or how's the ventilation relative to the gas prior to the membrane? So the one number that you definitely want from the pre-membrane is the PCO2, because you're going to be 
comparing that to the post membrane, but otherwise you don't have to worry too much about that pre membrane gas. The post membrane gas, on the other hand, is arguably the most important when it comes to talking about the circuit function or the membrane oxygenator function. And if you had to pick one value that's most important, that post membrane PaO2 is the most important value. And that's really telling you how well that membrane is working in just a single number. And so the number we're looking for here is greater than 300. That's a good sign that your membrane is working well. It's not clotting off. It's not going to be failing and needing to be replaced soon. If there's a number that's less than 200, you're very concerned that this oxygenator is going to stop working and to stop supporting the patient appropriately. And that circuit probably needs to be changed pretty quickly. Somewhere between 200 and 300, you're concerned, but you're probably not going to do anything necessarily at that point. You're just going to watch it pretty closely. So again, a post-membrane PaO2 of greater than 300 is very reassuring when it comes to looking at your circuit function. And then the other value that we're really looking at is the PCO2. And remember, we're comparing this to the pre-membrane and there should be a change. So a delta uh, PCO2 of around 10. And what we mean by that is, of course, your membrane works to remove some CO2 from the blood. So your post-membrane PCO2 should be about 10 points lower than your pre-membrane PCO2. That's another sign of good membrane function. All right, so a lot of data related to the patient there. Now we're gonna go into another pretty busy slide with data related to the machine or to the ECMO circuit. And again, just in terms of practical purposes, in EPIC, at least in our EPIC system, there's an ECMO flow sheet as the best way to find all these data and the lab data in one place and review it quite simply. Um, so that is definitely a recommendation I have for you if you're taking care of many of these patients. And another thing to keep in mind is a lot of these numbers, and I'll point out as we go, it's more about the trend, daily trend in these numbers. Is it increasing, decreasing, or staying the same as opposed to the absolute values? But when there are kind of typical absolute values that we're looking for, we'll point those out as well. All right, so to start, we've got the sweep. And what is the sweep? That's basically how much gas is flowing into this membrane oxygenator um, per minute. So this is in liters per minute. A typical value would be somewhere between three to five liters per minute, although the machine can technically go from like zero or one all the way up to around eight or 10, something like that. But a typical sweep might be somewhere around three to five, especially when you're starting. Sweep is really related to ventilation or clearance of CO2. Uh, and so if you're monitoring your blood gas and your um, arterial PCO2 is still too high, you could, for example, turn up the sweep uh, to help improve that. If the patient's getting better, a lot of times you start turning down the sweep and providing less support in that way. The flow, um, one way to think about this is, is just like the cardiac output of the machine itself. It's how much blood is flowing through that ECMO circuit total. So again, this is a little bit based on like body surface area of the patient and things like that that are related to cardiac output. But a good typical number is around three and a half to four liters of flow. RPMs, uh, this is important because it's closely related to flow. Remember, like I said, flow is kind of like the output of the machine, and that's basically based on your prelib to the machine, afterload to the machine, and then the RPMs, which is that the pump function, basically, um, or how quick the uh, rotations per minute are going in that pump. There's not really a number to know for the RPMs. Really, again, we're most worried about the flow itself. Um, however, if you're having to turn up the RPMs quite high, a uh, rate greater than 4,500 can lead to um, increases in lysis, which lysis, uh, which would be problematic in the long term. The other thing that can happen if we're increasing RPM, but the actual problem is, for example, a preload problem is we can get what's called chugging. That's kind of this function of uh, the blood vessels collapsing around that cannula that's taking blood out of the body. And then when it, when it does that, the um, tubing itself kind of jumps around. Again, that's a sign of low preload. If you have that, you need to give volume, usually albumin, blood, or crystalloid. Uh, this is something that you usually kind of get to report when you're talking to the ECMO tech in the morning. FDO2, this is a term you've seen many other places before. The D just stands for delivered because if you think about where you're normally talking about FiO2, right? Fraction of inspired oxygen. In this case, it's delivered since it's not being delivered uh, through inspiration. Uh, this is typically just 
right? Like 100% FiO2, in this case, it'd be 100% FiO2, and you usually don't titrate that very much at all. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then uh, we have our delta P, and delta P is the delta in pressure, and that's across the membrane itself. And so this is important because, again, it's telling us quite a bit about the uh, how the membrane is working, whether or not it might need to be changed soon. So obviously blood kind of flows from one side of the membrane to the other side. And as it pushes its way through the membrane, you're going to have a drop in pressure. So the delta P, there's gonna be a, a lesser pressure in the post membrane area as opposed to the pre. And that drop, um, the absolute value is not so important because it that differs depending on different setups, um, but common numbers would be something like 20 or maybe up to 50. Uh, but you should not see that change over time. You want that to stay stable. Um, if your delta P starts to increase, remember this is an absolute value, so that would mean that the drop is increasing across the membrane. Uh, if that delta P starts to increase, that usually means your membrane is starting to clot up and could be um, moving towards failure. And then finally, the last point of data related to the machine is just your daily chest x-ray, which all these patients should be getting. You want to look and confirm that you have good cannula position. Did the cannulas move? Obviously, if the cannula are moving quite significantly, you might need to reposition them, um, et cetera. Uh, another piece of data that you can get from the chest x-ray is looking at the lung fields themselves. This is usually more of a lagging indicator of function as opposed to things like we said, the tidal volumes and stuff like that. But if the lungs are starting to clear, that is obviously a positive sign. All right, so like we promised at the beginning of the video, we've kind of gone through a mass of complex data and it's your job to kind of sort through that each morning and get a sense of what's going on with the circuit. And it's, again, this is can be a monumental task, especially if you have, you know, not just one patient on ECMO, but three, four, five, and how do you keep all this straight? So a good way to think about this is really what you need to figure out each morning is one, is there an urgent need to change the circuit, right? Is this circuit failing? Is it going to fail in the way that it's unable to support the patient? Uh, in which case the patient could acutely die if you're not able to change that circuit rapidly. And number two is kind of looking at the big picture. Is this patient getting better? Are we able to start weaning down this ECMO and getting them off? We're not going to focus too much on number two uh, because that's kind of a less urgent, kind of more big picture decision. Uh, but what you really need to figure out each morning is number one. Is, is there signs that the circuit is starting to malfunction and needs to be changed? Or of course, just needs to be titrated to better suit the patient needs. So the way I've tried to put this together is to just give you a sense of, okay, if I'm going through the chart and I see all these things, I know that the circuit is good to go, that the circuit is stable. We're not going to need to make any big changes today. So the quick way I would go through a chart to confirm that is one, are the patient's vitals stable overall, right? No major issues with increased compressors or worsening SpO2, things like that. We want to make sure the cannula are in a stable position on that x-ray. We want that, remember, very important post-membrane PaO2 value to be greater than 300. That's a great sign. We'd like the delta PaCO2, so the change in CO2 across the membrane to be around 10, and certainly for the trend to be fairly stable. We want the patient's own ABG, the one drawn from the patient themselves, to have a an adequate um, partial pressure of oxygen. Again, we typically want that to be somewhere greater than 55. We want the pH to be adequate and we'll allow some permissive hypercapnia as long as that pH is okay. Uh, you can also, again, look at their SpO2 like we looked at on the vitals. That will give you a good sense that they're getting adequate oxygenation. We want a stable delta P. Remember, this is the delta in pressure across the membrane. We don't want that to be, that pressure differential to be increasing. Again, that would be a sign of the membrane starting to fail. Uh, it's good to know that they're not needing a bunch of blood transfusion. There's not a lot of chugging. Their kind of volume status is okay. And then we want to know that the uh, sweep didn't have to be increased, right, to support the patient and that the flows have been stable. Now, if all that is true, boom, you got a quick, you run through the patient numbers quick, you know that everything's okay. If it's not true, then you need to figure out, okay, do I need to titrate? differently to support the patient? Do I need to increase the sweep? Do we need to change the flows? Do we need to do something else? 
Uh, the other question is more related to the circuit. Is the circuit failing? And if that's the case, do we need to rapidly change the circuit so that we can do it while the patient's still stable, while the circuit's still functioning, uh, and do it before it completely gives out on us? Because, of course, that would lead to imminent death. Uh, and then finally, another kind of emergent issue is, was there a major change in position of the cannulas that needs to be dealt with uh, so the ECMO keeps working? Finally, like I said, we're not going to talk too much about this. Um, you want to know, is your patient getting better day by day? Some early signs of this would be an increase in tidal volumes, uh, better oxygenation, and then if you were starting to change the flows or the sweep, if the patient's tolerating uh, decreased flows or decreased sweeps related to the circuit. All right, so brief review. If I was getting the key data for each patient in the morning, what am I writing down? I'm definitely writing down that post-membrane PaCO2. I want that to be greater than 300. I'm looking at my delta PaCO2 across the membrane. I want that to be around 10. I'm looking at my sweep. I'm looking at those trends, making sure that my sweeps didn't have to go up to support the patient. I'm looking at my flows. Remember, those are often like three and a half to four liters making sure those are okay and I'm not ha having to do crazy things with the RPMs to keep those flows. I'm looking at my delta P, making sure there's no signs of that membrane starting to clot off or fail. And then finally, we're looking at the patient blood gas and making sure that is a blood gas that our patient can survive based off of. All right, and that's it. These videos are for educational purposes only, not used to diagnose or treat any diseases. This is not clinical advice, and we will see you next time.